to implement the law. Enactment of the President's FY 2013 budget would help us to fill the remaining gaps by hiring needed employees for frontline positions and also would permit us, importantly, to continue investing in technology initiatives that substantially and cost-effectively allow us to improve our ability to... Further proceedings under the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, it's been suggested that the uh, Senate should not move forward with Senator Hagel's nomination alleging that he has not complied with requests that he produce speeches. In fact, the standard committee questionnaire requires nominees to provide a copy of, quote, any formal speeches you have delivered during the last five years of which you have copies, close quote. Senator Hagel complied with this requirement before his hearing two weeks ago. Before the hearing, a number of requests were received from Republican members that Senator Hagel seek and obtain and provide to the committee some transcripts of additional speeches. And in fact, hundreds of pages of transcripts were in fact supplied to the committee before the hearing in addition to those that he had submitted in response to the committee questionnaire. Now, since then, we've received two additional requests for specific speeches, and in each case, we forwarded to Senator Hagel the requests. He sought and provided transcripts of speeches for which he had no prepared remarks and in which he had no copies. So he's responded to those requests and where he was able to obtain a transcript or a video of the speech from the organization that he addressed, he provided a copy. Where no such materials existed, he told us that that was the case. Senator Hagel was informed that a video of his remarks existed in one of those cases, but that the organization had been unable to find it. The organization has now located the video. It will be provided to the majority and minority staffs of the committee today. In the last few days, uh, there's been uh, a, some um, uh, finding of transcripts or videos surfaced on the internet. A handful of 2008, 2009 speeches, which Senator Hagel did not recollect. So I would ask unanimous consent that a list of links to the web transcripts or web videos and a list of Senator Hagel's potentially relevant Senate speeches that are part of the congressional record in 2008 also be included in the record immediately following my remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, Senator Hagel stated in his financial disclosure that he received $200,000 from Corsair Capital, which is a private equity firm, and he was a member of its advisory board. It's been alleged that Senator Hagel failed to provide complete financial disclosure despite the admitted lack of evidence of any kind and a highly negative innuendo was dropped by one of our colleagues, which said that the – and I quote – it said that it is at a minimum relevant to know if that $200,000, referring to those fees from Corsair Capital, that Senator Hagel deposited in his bank account came directly from Saudi Arabia or from North Korea without any evidence of any kind. That kind of an innuendo has been dropped here. It's inappropriate, unfair, untrue. Senator Hagel has provided the same financial disclosure met the same conflict of interest standards that the committee requires of all previous nominees. As I explained in a February 8, 2013 letter to my ranking member, Senator Inhofe, quote, our committee has a well-defined set of financial disclosure and ethics requirements 
which apply to all nominees for civilian positions in the Department of Defense. We have applied those disclosure requirements and followed this process for all nominees of both parties throughout the 16 years that I have served as chairman or ranking member of the Armed Services Committee. I understand that the same financial disclosure requirements and processes were followed for at least the previous 10 years during which Senator Sam Nunn served as chairman or ranking minority member. And I added, during this period, the committee's confirmed eight secretaries of defense, secretaries Carlucci, Cheney, Aspen, Perry, Cohen, Rumsfeld, Gates, and Panetta, as well as hundreds of nominees for other senior civilian positions in the department. The committee cannot have two different sets of financial disclosure standards for nominees one for Senator Hagel and one for other nominees. As required by the Senate Armed Services Committee and by the Ethics in Government Act, Senator Hagel has disclosed all compensation over $5,000 that he has received in the last two years. As required by the Armed Services Committee, he has received letters from the Director of the Office of Government Ethics and the Acting Department of Defense General Counsel certifying that he has met all applicable financial disclosure and conflict of interest requirements. As required by the Armed Services Committee, he has answered a series of questions about possible foreign affiliations. Among other questions, the committee asks whether, during the last 10 years, the nominee or his spouse has, quote, received any compensation from or been involved in any financial or business transactions with a foreign government or an entity controlled by a foreign government, close quote, and Senator Hagel's answer was no. Now, Mr. President, President, would the uh, distinguished chairman of the Armed Services Committee yield for a question? I'd be happy to. Uh, Mr. President, I've listened to uh, the presentation of this. Basically, what you're saying is all the rules that were in place for nominees to the Department of Defense under Republican presidents, you're following the same rules with. Senator Hagel, but there are some who want to go beyond uh, or go to different rules than what we had for, say, Dick Cheney when he was secretary or uh, Donald Rumsfeld or um, Gates or any of the others. You're saying that they want now to do something different for this nominee of President Obama's than what they found totally acceptable for the nominees of President Bush. The Senator is uh, correct. A number of our colleagues have uh, made that uh, demand, and it's uh, just simply not something that we're going to set a precedent on. It's not the uh, way to proceed in this body. Mr. President, I, I stand with the Senator uh, from Michigan. I, you know, we follow in the Judiciary Committee, we follow the same procedure for our questions for our judges that we did when it was a Republican president. And if we want to keep switching back and forth, depending upon who is president, uh, if we think that the American public is concerned about Congress and holds in low esteem, it's going to be even worse. So I, I compliment the senator for sticking to his, to his uh, standards. I thank uh, my good friend from Vermont. Uh, and, uh, um, just to complete my statement on the financial part, um, and this relative to the funds that he received, the fees that he received uh, when he was um, on the advisory board of Corsair Capital. This is a company that doesn't control, not in position to require that it disclose anything. Uh, the other members of the advisory board, all of whom were identified, by the way, on the company's website, include the chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International, who's a laureate of the 2002 Israel Prize in Economics and a recipient of the Scopus Award from Hebrew University, 
other members of the advisory board, the former director of investments for Yale University, former chairman of the Financial Services Authority, which is responsible for regulating the insurance industry in the United Kingdom. So the innuendo that Corsair Capital is somehow a puppet entity that is funneling tainted money to members of its advisory board is unfair. It is totally inappropriate. Now, Senator Inhofe said yesterday that he's not filibustering this nomination. He's just insisting on a 60-vote requirement for Senate approval. And said that it's not unusual to insist on 60 votes for the approval of a nominee, and this was done during the Bush administration for the nomination of Stephen Johnson to be EPA administrator and the nomination of Dirk Kempthorne to be Secretary of Interior. Well, the Senate rules do not provide for 60-vote approval of nominations or any other matter. These rules establish a 60-vote requirement to invoke cloture and end debate. 60 votes are, if, if 60 votes are required here, it's because there's a filibuster. There's no 60-vote requirement for the approval of a nomination. And the two examples cited by Senator Inhofe actually prove this point. The nomination of, of Stephen Johnson Cloture was invoked by 61 to 37 on April 29, 2005. The nomination of Dirk Kempthorne, cloture was invoked by an 85 to 8 vote on May 26, 2006. But, and this is the point, after the debate was ended by those votes on cloture, the nominations were confirmed by regular votes of this body. And those regular votes are either a voice vote or a majority vote on a roll call vote. So that history is again an example of how the Senate operates. 60 votes aren't required to approve a bill or approve a nomination. If a matter is being filibustered, 60 votes are required to end the debate. And then if the debate is ended, there is a vote on a nomination or a bill. No nomination for the secret position of Secretary of Defense has ever before been filibustered. This filibuster breaks new ground. The filibuster of a nomination for Secretary of Defense is first, the first one under any circumstances. And it is unwise. The department is facing a budget crisis that was described as a 10 on the scale of 1 to 10 by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So a filibuster at this time of a budget crisis is exceptionally ill-advised, leaving the Department of Defense leaderless at a time when we are in an Afghan conflict, when North Korea has just exploded a nuclear device, is exceptionally ill-advised. And perhaps most important, having a Department of Defense which does not have a new secretary confirmed is unfair to the men and women in uniform. It sends them exactly the wrong message as it does to our friends and our adversaries around the world. And Mr. President, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. President. Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, again, I applaud what uh, Senator Levin said about Senator Hagel. I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I applaud what uh, Senator Levin has said about Senator Hagel. You know, when you, when you think that here's a man who, if you could go and just do a kind of a perfect list of who should be Secretary of Defense, it'd be Chuck Hagel. And if you strip out the partisan posturing of some, I think the American public knows he should be Secretary of Defense. I worry that the kind of partisan posturing we've seen adds to the reason why the 
both the U.S. House and U.S. Senate are held in such low esteem. It is not the way we should be doing the country's business. I strongly support the nomination of Chuck Hagel to be Secretary of Defense. I urge all senators to support it. We're at a time of fiscal austerity. We all understand that, but we need a leader at the Pentagon who understands what it takes to maintain the strongest military force in the world. Senator Hagel is a former enlisted soldier. He understands defense policy and the practice from the ground up. He's the leader we need as Secretary of Defense. He's experienced by any measure. Like many of the people he will lead in the Pentagon, he's earned a combat infantryman's badge. And this is not something that is in the abstract. He has two purple hearts from combat service in Vietnam. He still carries shrapnel in his body from his injuries on any issue having to do with the U.S. military. I've long valued the first-hand experience of Chuck Hagel. But it, this service alone is not what makes him qualified. He's been a leader in the public and private sectors. He co-founded Vanguard Cellular Systems, a successful cellular carrier in the 90s, 1980s and 90s. He was president and CEO of the USO and the chief operating officer of the 1990 G7 summit. He served as president of an investment bank on the board of some of the world's largest companies and as a two-term United States senator, clearly a qualified nominee. Now, since his nomination was announced last month, some have questioned Senator Hagel's position on a number of issues, notably his support for Israel. Well, as recently as confirmation hearings, he's reaffirmed his long record of support for Israel. He has affirmed the U.S. commitment to Israel's security and Israel's right to defend itself against aggression by any objective measure. He's committed to the mutual interest of the United States and Israel. An attacks suggesting that Senator Hagel is soft on Iran is also baseless. There's not a shred of evidence to support claims he supports a nuclear Iran or that he does not support the president's efforts, unilateral and multilateral, to bring Iran to the negotiating table over its nuclear program. Senator Hagel supports the sanctions against Iran already in place. And any assertion that he accepts Iran's nuclear program is false. Then there are the bogus inflammatory claims. Senator Hagel is soft on terrorism. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's not hesitated to call Hezbollah and Hamas what they are, terrorist organizations. He condemns Iran, support of Hezbollah, and co-sponsored Senate resolutions demanding that Hamas recognize Israel's right to exist. I might say, Mr. President, I've traveled in different parts of the world, combat areas and uh, areas of great security concern to the United States. I've sat in meetings with Senator Hagel when he's talked with our intelligence uh, people, our defense people, and I, I'll be somewhat vague on this only because most of these meetings were of a highly classified nature. But I can tell you this, based on my own experience in the Senate, he was a tough questioner, raised over and over again the security interests of the United States, both with our own people, but also with leaders and others in other countries. There is no question uh, in this, and I, I remember the, uh, on some of those trips, senators who were with us in both parties responding so favorably to the way Senator Hagel conducted these meetings. Well, some have suggested he recklessly weakened the defense budget. There's nothing in his record that supports this. He opposes cuts that would weaken our security. He vigorously opposes sequestration, which has been rightly compared to meat cleaver. And like Secretary Panetta and Secretary Gates, 
Chuck Hagel believes the Pentagon has a role to play in deficit reduction, but not the expense of keeping our military the preeminent fighting force in the world. He says reductions must be smart and strategic. I agree. And I'm confident that our men and women in uniform will have no stronger advocate, that our nation will have a stalwart defender in Chuck Hagel. Senator Hagel, who has seen combat from the perspective of an enlisted member of our armed forces, sees our military as the last resort, not the first resort, in international relations. Those who have been in combat from President Eisenhower on through have taken that same position. No matter what any detractor may say, that's sound policy. Matters of war and peace are also matters of life and death. Some want to sit in boardrooms or in easy chairs and say, let us commit our soldiers here and our soldiers there. And our... They're not the ones going. It's not their families that are going. It's not members of their family that are going. I want somebody who knows what it's like. Should we commit our troops when it is necessary for our defense? Of course, that's why we have them. But let's not assume there's some kind of an exercise on paper. Senator Hagel, decorated veteran who walks with the shrapnel from his wounds in Vietnam, understands a decision to go to war is a decision to send our sons and daughters, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers into harm's way. It is his deep, visceral understanding of this fact, his record of experience, his patriotism, and his dedication to this nation to qualify him to be the next Secretary of Defense, so we should have the vote and confirm this patriot American hero. And let's not hide behind a filibuster. Let's have the courage, vote yes or vote no. Don't hide behind parliamentary tricks. The American people elected us to vote yes or vote no. And when you want to set up a filibuster rule or something, you're basically saying, let's vote maybe. That does not show a profile in courage, and certainly not the kind of courage we'd expect from a Secretary of Defense. So let's vote yes, let's vote no. Let's do it without delay. I will vote yes. And I ask my full statement be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Suggest the absence of a quorum. Ask the time be equally divided. Senator from Indiana. Oh, sorry. Will the senator withdraw his request? I, 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 the, uh, senator, seek a I withdraw my uh, suggestion of a quorum. I thank the senator and I uh, ask, uh, Mr. President, the unanimous consent that I speak as if in morning business. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. President, earlier this week uh, I outlined four main topics that I hope to hear the president discuss in his State of the Union address. Today I'd like to talk in more detail about one of those items and perhaps the most challenging, restructuring Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security to preserve them for current and future generations. In Washington, these three programs fall into the category of spending, mandatory spending, meaning that they are not contingent on annual congressional review or funding. Instead, they're based on formulas that have already been written into law, and therefore this spending occurs automatically as if it's on autopilot. So anyone who becomes eligible for the program based on the requirements in the law automatically qualifies for the benefits. And we don't have the ability on a year-to-year -year basis to, to review or change this. We can only make structural changes and reforms to the program uh, as, uh, as necessary. Today, these items make up a majority of government's annual budget. And this is because when these programs were implemented, they did not take into account the remarkable and wonderful increase in the lifespan of Americans, nor the impact of the post-World War II baby boom generation. Reaching re the point of retirement age, which is now at the level of about 10,000 retirements each and every day of the year, and that is putting an enormous strain on the budget, our overall budget, and the amount of the proportion of that budget that goes to funding these mandatory programs. 
After World War II and after a long decade of depression, uh, America saw, Americans saw a bright new future. And they came home from the war and they began to start families. And millions upon millions and millions of children were born in a period between 1945 and 1950 or the early 50s. And this is the so-called baby, baby boom generation. Now, initially when they were born, uh, uh, certain industries uh, came into play. If you, you were in the diaper business, uh, suddenly uh, you were in the boom business. Or cribs and strollers and then tricycles and then bicycles. Uh, these children moved on to the age where they began to el uh, enter uh, elementary school. And we built schools all over the country to accommodate this bulge of new parts of our, of our human species uh, working their way through the system. And then it was junior highs, and we not, then we needed to enlarge our high schools, and, and new colleges and universities sprung up across the land. Uh, upon graduation, uh, they found jobs, and it was time to start their own families. And housing boomed. And throughout the whole lifespan of this baby boom generation, uh, there have been enormous economic changes uh, to adapt to this massive amount of people working their way through, uh, through life and becoming such an integral part uh, of the American dream and the American history. So we often talk now about this uh, issue in cold hard facts because this generation is reaching retirement age and as I said moving into retirement and qualification, therefore, for Social Security and Medicare coverage uh, in massive numbers, 10,000 or more a day. But when we talk about it in just cold, hard facts and cold numbers, um, we tend to ignore the impact of these programs in a much more personal way on our American public. Becoming eligible for the programs we're talking about here means access to health care during a more difficult time of life. You no longer are perhaps covered by your employer because you have uh, made the decision to retire or reach retirement age. And there are health care issues as we age that, uh, uh, which we wish didn't happen, but they come on in uh, ever-increasing uh, intensity. It means grandparents having enough money to travel to see the kids and a new grandbaby. It means men and women who have worked hard all of their lives to provide for their families, finally having the financial freedom to take some time off and retire. Hoosiers and Americans all across this land have paid into the system all through their working years. They rely on these health and retirement security programs and its benefits. These are honest, hard-working men and women who have been told that if they made contributions through their paycheck, to these programs, they would become eligible at a certain age for a certain standard of coverage, and they expect to receive that. So the challenge before us today is to make sure that these benefits continue to be available to both current and future recipients. But as we examine our nation's current fiscal state, we all need to come to terms with the fact that these programs will not be available in their current form if we don't make some necessary changes. The Heritage Foundation reports that mandatory spending is increasing at almost six times faster than all other spending. In other words, spending on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security is growing faster than all of our spending on defense, education, infrastructure, medical research, food and drug safety, homeland security, and I don't begin to have the time to, to list all the various functions of spending uh, that go toward uh, uh, reaching out and meeting the needs of this country. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office reported this month that spending on these programs and interest on the debt will consume 91 percent of all federal revenues 10 years from now. Imagine our budget as being a pie, a big pie here, and it's cut in certain slices in terms of how much money is spent on defense, how much money is spent on these mandatory programs I'm just talking about, and the amount of money that's spent on all the other functions that the federal government is engaged in. That part of the pie 
that provides for the automatically entitled uh, mandatory spending benefits is growing at a rate uh, which is unsustainable. It is ever shrinking the defense and non-discretionary part, everything else we spend money on, and we spend too much money on too many things, and so we're going to have to be very careful, and I've talked about this many times in terms of how we spend and allocate those funds in the future. But unless we address this runaway mandatory spending issue, um, we're not going to be able to have the funds to do even essential, constitutionally mandated, like providing for our national security and making funds available for paving roads or health care research or education or whatever else uh, uh, we feel that it's appropriate for our federal government to engage in. Furthermore, this mandatory spending has enormous impacts on our young people. In a recent New York Times column titled Carpe Diem Nation, David Brooks wrote about two ways spending on health and retirement security programs not only uh, threatens our economic growth but hurts young people. He said, and I quote, it squeezes government investment programs that boost future growth. And secondly, the young will have to pay the money back. He goes on to say, and I quote again, to cover current obligations according to the International Monetary Fund, young people will have to pay 35% in more taxes and receive 35% fewer benefits. And that's the plight we are in. That's a situation we are in. These are the hold card, uh, cold hard facts. Uh, this is the math that we have to deal with. But we have to do so understanding that how we deal with this directly affects people's lives, directly affects the benefits that they rely on uh, for their retirement and for their health care. So the challenge before us is to understand that if we don't do something, this 35% higher taxes and 35% fewer benefits on our young is not only unacceptable, I think it's, in my opinion, immoral. Immoral for our generation and for this Congress and our executive to leave our children and grandchildren in such a position without doing something about it. And so the challenge before us and the goal this body should be striving for is finding common ground, not on how to eliminate these programs, but on how to save these programs, while at the same time ensuring that we have adequate resources to finance the essential and necessary functions of the federal government. That starts with our constitutional obligation to provide for the national security and the security of the American public, as well as providing for the general welfare. Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, have recognized that we need to restructure Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security if we are serious about putting this country on sounder fiscal footing and if we are going to be able to keep these programs from becoming insolvent. And hopefully there are members on both sides of the political spectrum that agree that we need to make the changes now in order to avoid more painful changes later. We have been postponing this action and these needed legislative processes for decades. It's always been, it's, it's too hot to handle. It's too politically damaging. It might put us in uh, a political jeopardy. The President in the State of the Union address said it's time that we put the interest of our nation ahead of our own personal political interest. I couldn't agree more. That's what we should always be doing. But we have not done that when it comes to this critical issue that has such an enormous impact on everything we do and such an enormous impact on people who have saved all of their lives and on future uh, for the benefits that they are promised when they retired or became a certain age. And the young people of this country who are coming out of school starting a family, getting a job, hoping to also participate in the American dream, owning a home and raising a family, and having the freedom uh, that our country provides us in ways that no other country ever has and perhaps ever will. We're just so blessed to have been born in this country, to live in this country, and to have the freedom and the possibility of achieving the, our dreams. 
But all those are in jeopardy if we don't address this situation. So for decades now, we have known what was coming. We have seen this bulge of baby boomers move through the entire life cycle and now reaching retirement age. But we have postponed over and over and over. We have come up with short-term solutions over and over and over and failed to come up with any solutions over and over and over. Time is now. It's a, we are at the point where if we don't do something now, the prediction of David Brooks is going to take place. Our young people are going to be saddled with ever higher taxes to hold up a system that's going to only be able to deliver ever lower benefits. So as we consider the right path to move forward, we need to acknowledge that any bipartisan congressional effort to reform and preserve these programs will be unsuccessful unless the President shows a willingness to get involved and engage fully in this effort. I believe he understands the magnitude of the issue because he has said, and I quote, I refuse to leave our children with a debt they cannot repay. We all want a government that lives within its means. We need to get our fiscal horse, house in order now. We cannot kick this can down the road. We're at the end of the road, said the President of the United States. In comments made when he was a senator, comments he made when he was a candidate for president, in comments he made when he was president during his first four years, in comments he made subsequent to that in his inaugural address and in his recent State of the Union address. But we need more than talk. We need engagement. We need engagement of the President if we're going to make this, these difficult decisions to put our country on a better fiscal path and to save these programs for those who have put their hard-earned work and money into them and now qualify for those benefits. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the President of his repeated commitment to reduce our debt and deficit. I want to remind him of, his many, of the many times he has talked about the need to fix Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. But now, Mr. President, what I'd like to say is this. We need more than your soaring rhetoric, more than the promises you made. We need your direct engagement. If we're going to address this fiscal crisis, and essentially do what I think all of us know we need to do. We basically have two options. We can continue with the status quo and wait until a moment, the moment that a crisis hits. No longer can send out the checks. Must raise taxes once again to cover a program which should and should have received needed reforms or at the point where the programs become saving. Or the alternative is we can come together and commit to the American people that we will act and no longer avoid or delay the challenging but necessary tax, task of fixing these programs to save them for future generations. Mr. President, I stand ready. I trust my colleagues stand ready to address this issue now. And we're asking you to stand with us. Let's do what we all know we need to do to restore our nation to fiscal health, to save these programs from insolvency, to grow our economy and get Americans back to work. Mr. President, the time is now. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. President. I am proud to stand here today to support the nomination of Chuck Hagel as our next Secretary of Defense, and I believe he will be confirmed by this chamber, I hope on a bipartisan basis, because he is, in fact, extraordinarily qualified for this position of unique trust and responsibility. And that is the criterion that we must apply is he qualified? 
We may have, probably each of us does have among us 100 senators, someone whom we would make our first choice or a better choice or the right person in our view. But that's not the question before us. It is whether he is qualified to be part of the president's team and to be held accountable for the policies that the president sets. Chuck Hagel is a decorated war veteran with two Purple Hearts. He is a highly successful businessman and entrepreneur, a real manager at a time when we need a manager in the Department of Defense. He is a former colleague as a member of this body, but he is also a former deputy head of the Veterans Administration. So he has really given his life to public service and most especially to helping men and women in uniform while they serve this country in the military and then when they come back to civilian life, helping them contribute and continuing to give back to this nation. And he is a Republican who has won the confidence of President Obama and whom President Obama has chosen to be a member of his team. We speak as members of the Senate about giving the President a measure of deference, a prerogative in making the selection about who will serve on his team because it is the President who sets policy. The President will set our policy on the Middle East and on Israeli security. Chuck Hagel has said he is committed unequivocally, clearly, unambiguously to the security of Israel, to whatever weapon systems are necessary to provide Israel in maintaining and sustaining that security. The Iron Dome, David's Sling, other measures that this nation has committed to its great ally in the Middle East, an ally that is necessary not only to stability there and hopefully to peace, but also to our national interest. And Chuck Hagel may have made comments in the past that seem to vary somewhat from the president's policy, but it is the president who sets that policy and whom we will hold accountable for that policy. And likewise on Iran, Chuck Hagel has said that he is in favor of preventing a nuclear armed Iran, not containing it, but preventing it. And whatever his past statements, it is the president who sets that policy and Chuck Hagel has indicated that he is completely in accord with it, in support of it, and will implement it. And again, it is the policy of the president to prevent a nuclear armed Iran and we must in this body give support and encouragement to the president in being strong and tough, setting even stronger and tougher sanction and using the military option if necessary to stop a nuclear armed Iran. Going from policy to what I think is perhaps the unique challenge of the next Secretary of Defense, which is to attract and retain the best and the brightest to our military. We talk all the time about people being our greatest asset in the military. We have weapon systems that defy the imagination, let alone comprehension. But at the end of the day, the people who run those weapon systems, the people who staff and work every day to keep America safe are the ones who are our greatest asset. And at a time when we are bringing troops back from Afghanistan and when Secretary-to-be, hopefully Hagel, has indicated that we ought to do it even more quickly, our greatest challenge will be to prevent the hollowing out of our military as has occurred in the wake of past conflict. 
That hollowing out is not only about hardware and weapons, it is about the people who command and the people who run those weapons. And we need to make sure that we keep those mid-level officers and enlisted that are so important to the leadership of our military and Chuck Hagel's leadership and commitment will be critical to that task. I have met with Chuck Hagel privately. I've asked him tough questions about Iran and Israel. I'm satisfied on those points that he will advise the president in accord with those policies. But even more important, I am struck by his passion, the intensity of his commitment to our men and women in uniform. His caring about them is indicated in so many ways, spontaneously and strongly in his testimony as well as his private conversation. He will make sure that sexual assault in the military, the epidemic and scourge of rape and assault against men and women who serve and sacrifice in, for this country will be stopped, that there will be, in fact, zero tolerance, not only in word, but in deed. And his viewing, for example, of the documentary Invisible War, his understanding that this kind of misconduct is an outrage, never to be even implicitly condoned, and to be treated as a criminal offense, the most extreme kind of predatory criminal activity, is important to the future of our military and our men and women in uniform. He is committed to making sure that women in combat, a policy of the President, is implemented forcefully and faithfully. He is committed to make sure that the policy of repealing don't ask, don't tell is implemented zealously and vigorously. He is committed to making sure that PST, not only for the returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, but also for the veterans of his own generation, our Vietnam veterans, who had PSD at a time when it was undiagnosed and in fact unknown as a condition resulting from combat. He is con committed to making sure that they have the benefit of policies and practices that now we are implementing to deal with PST and uh, traumatic brain injury. And he is committed, equally importantly, to making sure that the epidemic of suicide among our currently serving men and women in uniform and also our veterans is addressed forcefully. There are tragedies every day involving those suicides, families that lose loved ones and a country that loses great public servants. And Chuck Hagel cares about those men and women. And he will see a person in uniform not as simply an officer or enlisted man, but as someone who will soon be a veteran as part of a continuum. He has served in the VA as well as now in the Defense Department, and he will make sure that the transition from active service to reservist service is seamless that veterans are provided with that transition assistance that they need for employment and education, health care, and that our National Guard receives the respect and service it deserves. I'm convinced that Senator Hagel's number one priority will be taking care of our troops. He is a veterans advocate with the USO, and he's won the respect and admiration of veterans groups. In addition, he's won the support of an extraordinary array of former secretaries of defense, ambassadors and diplomats, senior retired military leaders, and 
in particular, two former members of this body who appeared with him at his testimony, former Senators Warner and Nunn. I believe that Chuck Hagel is the right man for the challenges, the fiscal challenges, that will confront the Department of Defense. Put aside sequester, which I dearly hope will not happen. Secretary Panetta said it would be irresponsible for the Congress to allow it to happen. Many of us agree it must be avoided. But apart from that challenge in the next month or series of months, the long-term outlook for the Department of Defense is that it must do more with less. And Secretary Hagel, if he is confirmed, will have that management task. And he is one of the people in this country who is almost uniquely qualified to carry it out. And I believe that he will with great distinction. He will take care of our men and women in uniform and strengthen our national defense. He will do what he thinks is right, even if it's not popular. And he is finally, as everyone has said, a good and decent man. I thank in particular Senator McCain for his very compelling and telling comment during our consideration before the vote in the Armed Services Committee. He said, and I agree, no one should impugn Chuck Hagel's character. He's a person of integrity and character. And I believe that he will have the respect at all levels of our defense, men and women who serve and sacrifice every day, men and women who are essential to our national security. And I recommend and I urge my colleagues to support him. I respectfully hope that he will be confirmed quickly and that it will be done on a bipartisan basis so that we will be united as our Armed Services Committee in this body is almost always in favor of the President's choice for this uniquely important responsibility. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. The Republican Whip. Madam President, I rise to mark another sad record for the United States Senate. 1,387 days since the United States Senate has passed a budget. 1,387 days. The last time I checked, the 2012 election is over. And uh, of course, it's been over for more than three months now, but unfortunately, the president still seems to be very much in campaign mode, giving speeches all around the country. At, a time, at the time, for the time being, what we really need, rather than a president on a perpetual campaign, is for Democrats and Republicans to work together to try to solve some of our nation's most pressing problems. And there is no more important issue than our national debt. Unfortunately, the President, after extracting about $600 billion in new taxes, as a result of the fiscal cliff negotiation, is still coming back to the well. And he's calling for tens, tens of billions of dollars of new spending at a time when we ought to be talking about bending the cost curve down, try to rein in wasteful Washington spending. The President wants to spend more, and he wants to raise your taxes to do it. And perhaps worst of all, we know that the promises we made to our seniors for Medicare and Social Security are imperiled. Unless we act together to save and protect Social Security and Medicare, they are on a pathway to bankruptcy. And that's irresponsible and wrong. 
I'm tempted to describe President Obama's spending and tax ideas as small ball, but they're worse than that. They represent a conscious decision to neglect some of the most pressing issues that confront our country. You might even say it's a dereliction of duty in the battle to save America. Last week, the Congressional Budget Office projected that our gross national debt will increase from $16 trillion in 2012 to, six, to $26 trillion in 2023. Now, that may seem like a long way off, but just since President Obama has been president, the national debt's gone up by 55 percent just in the last four years. But if you project that forward to 2023, when some of these young men and women who are working here as pages will be looking at uh, entering the workforce and looking at their futures, all they will see ahead of them is debt and a reduced standard of living. This is what lies ahead for all of us unless we embrace real spending cuts and unless we deal with the unfunded liabilities of Medicare and Social Security. Now, President Obama has a secret strategy for getting our debt under control. We'd all love to hear it. His last two budget proposals failed to receive a single vote in the United States Senate. That's the last two years that his budget has actually been put to a vote. No Democrat voted for it and no Republican because it simply didn't address the problems that I just described. I hope this year is different. Unfortunately, the President's already missed the deadline, the statutory deadline for submitting his own budget, which was February the 4th. But I hope when he finally gets around to sending us his proposed budget, it's a serious plan for long-term debt reduction. Based on experience, I can't say that I'm overly optimistic. But Hope springs eternal. I guess one of the things that worries me the most is in the President's State of the Union message, which he so eloquently delivered just a few nights ago, he didn't say one word about his 2014 budget. Not one word. I would urge the President to take a long, hard look at the new Congressional Budget Office report. I would urge him to launch serious bipartisan budget negotiations as soon as possible so we can avoid another last-minute cliffhanger and another 2 a.m. Senate vote. Above all, I would urge the President to take a look at a, at a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution that I've co-sponsored along with all of my colleagues on this side of the aisle. That amendment would require the federal government to balance its budget each and every year. Is that such a crazy idea? Well, no. That's what every family has to do. That's what every small business has to do, and that's what 49 states are required to do under their laws. This amendment to the Constitution, it would be the 28th amendment to the Constitution, including the first 10, which are, of course, our Bill of Rights. It would require a congressional supermajority to raise taxes or to raise the debt ceiling. As I said a moment ago, families across America have to balance their budgets. And of course, along with a budget brings the discipline of deciding what your priorities are, the things you have to have and you can't live without, the things that you want but you have to defer, and then the things that maybe you'd like to have but you just simply can't afford. Well, that's this number right here, 1,387 days since the Senate passed the budget, is one reason why our debt continues to go up by leaps and bounds, and there's no plan in sight to bring it under control. Here's the bottom line for President Obama. The 2012 election is over, and now it's time to govern. It's time to move beyond the campaign rhetoric, drop the gimmicks, and work across the aisle with Republicans to do what's right for the country. We're ready willing and able to engage with the President and our Democratic colleagues to try to address these problems that confront our country. In fact, there's no good reason for any of us to be here unless we're willing to do that. Madam President, I yield the floor.
Madam President, well, uh, the senator from Texas is still on the floor. I think he knows I have a lot of uh, respect and affection for him. I'm delighted to serve with him here and, and also to serve with him on the, the Finance Committee. I, I want to ask, I appreciate uh, Senator Shaheen and uh, Senator Hovind. Let me just jump in here for just, uh, just a minute. Uh, we agree on so much. We actually do. And uh, not just you and I, but our colleagues here, Democrat and Republican, I think we, uh, we fully acknowledge that although the deficits come down from about $1.5 to about $850 uh, billion, dollars, it's still way, way, way too much. And I think we also agree that one of the best ways to reduce the deficit is to strengthen the economy and to grow the economy. I believe, and I th think I heard the President say this the other night, and I, I know you do as well, three things that we need to, to make sure that we address. One, uh, we, uh, we need to uh, address, the President said this, we need to address entitlement problems, now, not to savage old people or to savage poor people, but to figure out how to get better health care results uh, for less money, be able to preserve those programs for the long haul. And I think we'll have an interesting uh, proposal from Senator Durbin later this year with respect to uh, uh, Social Security, and I think putting in a structure and a way, uh, or maybe a path forward on, on Social Security that makes it clear we're not trying to balance the budget on, uh, on, on Social Security, but actually to do the reforms that you know are needed and I know they're needed, so we'll have that program for a long haul. I think on, on my side of the aisle, and I think on your side of the aisle, we acknowledge the need for some revenues, whether it's on the uh, tax expenditure side, the deductions and the loopholes and so forth, or whether it's finding other ways to, to raise revenues. And the third thing, we just uh, come from a uh, press conference this morning with uh, Congressman Issa, Congressman Cummings, uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Coburn and myself, and the focus on with GAO, their high risk list, high risk ways for, for uh, uh, wasting money. It comes out today. Every two years they give us this high risk list for how to find ways to save money, spend our tax dollars more efficiently. We've got all that working together, those three things, entitlement reform, uh, some additional revenues, and actually look in every nook and cranny of the federal government and say, how do we get a better result for less money? Those are things we can do together. And uh, my colleague and I work on some things together, and I want to work on those three with you and look forward to doing that. And I think if we do, a lot of our colleagues will join us. Thank Madam you. Madam President, would the Senator yield for a Senate, question? The Republican Whip. I'm, Madam President, I want to tell the distinguished Senator from